If you have your Bible today, please turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. A little bit like yesterday, we won't actually read the text until we get near the end. I said we don't usually do that, but now we're two in a row, so I don't know if we'll do it all week. We'll see what happens. I'm really excited to be back with you this morning, and we're going to continue to think about God's presence and that big story of God's presence but the big problem of our sin. As we said yesterday, God is everywhere, right? He is omnipresent, but there are also ways that He is present especially. Present to bless. Present, we'll think about today, graciously. Presence as a sign of His covenant, His care, His provision, His blessing. That to be blessed, as we saw in the ending of the story, is to see God face to face. That's his plan. God made us, made human beings for relationship with him, to live in his presence forever. That was his plan from the beginning, and it's where everything is going. So the Christian hope was never just avoiding hell and being in heaven one day where we don't have to have any pain and can have a good time. It's seeing God face to face. It's living with him and all his people in the new heavens and the new earth. Our hope is not just disembodied soul life. It is resurrection body with God and all His people where everything wrong is made right and nothing can interrupt or interfere with that blessedness, with that joy. The joy of being with God Himself. But as you know, there's a problem, right? All the way back in the beginning, in the garden, there was what we could call an interruption and interference that we still feel this morning. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, sin and the curse brought disastrous consequences that carry on to this very day, that we feel every single day day. And what happened there, right? Adam and Eve, they realized on the other side of their sin when they heard God walking in that cool of the day, they hid themselves. They realized they no longer belonged in God's presence. God comes to them and instead of confessing their sin, what do they do? Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. There's an interruption, an interference that messes up their relationship with God and their relationships with one another and even their relationships to God's good creation. Sin separated them from God. And sin separated them from one another. And sin is still doing that to this very day. You feel it. You know it. And you're part of it. Every single one of us has joined. We are sinners, theologians tell us, by nature and by choice. Because it didn't stop with Adam and Eve, right? They had kids. And we know the story of Cain and Abel. Siblings always get along so well. We have some, how many of you, you have a sibling that's in this room right now? Okay, great. So for those of you who uh, remember last year, I said the words, do not recommend, like a hundred times in that week, right? Okay, thank you, Adam. (laughs) This is definitely a do not recommend story from Cain and Abel, right? We can recommend Abel, but we do not recommend what happened between Cain and Abel. And what happened in that story? Abel's offering is accepted. Cain's is not. And his face fell. His countenance changed. He's upset. The Lord even comes to him and tells him, don't give in. This sin wants to get you, but you don't have to go there. But then he couldn't get over it. And as he was talking with his brother in the field, he rose up and killed his brother. The first sons of Adam and Eve, and one murders the other. And we know that much of the story And maybe you know a little more of the story, how God put a mark on Cain and he was going to be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. But as God pronounced that judgment 
on him. Here is Cain's response. Listen to these words. This is from Genesis 4. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. From your face, I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And God assured him, I'll put a mark on you, and people will know, and they will not kill you. But then a verse later, Genesis 4, 16, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. God had driven out Cain's parents from the garden and put cherubim around it so that they couldn't come back in to his place where they had refused to live under his good rule. And now it's happening again in their son. Yes, Cain wouldn't be killed, but he would go away from the presence of the Lord. Skipping way forward, when David sinned, Psalm 51, he's concerned about losing God's presence. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Another story we know well, the story of Jonah, right? Uh, I'm emboldened to ask this because of a conversation last night. Some of you are going to be like, I do not know what you're talking about at all. How many of you grew up on Patch the Pirate? Okay, yes, I see that hand in the back. I could have figured that one. All right. I, yes, I see my own kids' hands. Good. Um, <laughs> all right. So, only a few hands. That is fine. There's a song by Patch the Pirate about Jonah, right? What is it, Zachary? It's been a long time since, it's been a long time since that. That's a really old one. That's from like when Michael and I were kids. Dr. Moore and I were kids. Uh, about Jonah, Jonah. Did not obey God immediately, Jonah, Jonah, down in the depths of the deep blue sea. And I appreciate Patch the Pirate, and I appreciate that song. And there's an element that we might miss. And it's good to obey right away. If that's the thing that you need for today, do that, right? When you are given instruction this week, obey. But Jonah was doing more than just disobeying. We think of him as the disobedient prophet, and that's certainly right. He certainly was a disobedient prophet. But as we're thinking about our theme for this week, and I want you to kind of put some glasses on to start seeing this as you read your Bible, because we are just scratching the surface this week. It is everywhere. It was in my reading for this morning in 2 Chronicles, where Asa as the king, and this is not in the not in the notes for today, where Asa as the king, they sought the Lord and they found him, right? It's in the context of battles and who was ruling where and how many hundreds of thousands of people were in the army, but they sought the Lord and they found him. It's everywhere through your Bible and it's in the story of Jonah too. God told Jonah what to do and where to go, right? To go to Nineveh. But what happens in Jonah 1.3? But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. Here's these next words that until you're thinking with these lenses, you probably won't even see are there. From the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was not just running from duty. He was running from the Lord. And when we are disobeying, when we are going our own way, when we are doing our own thing, we are not just rebelling against an earthly authority. We are moving ourselves away from the presence of the Lord. And ultimately, this is what eternal judgment looks like. In 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Heaven and earth can't even stand before him. Revelation 20, 11, just a few verses before we started reading yesterday. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and heaven and the sky fled away and no place was found for them. 
And here are some words we read yesterday, and I promised we'd come back, and here we are. There was all that about what's good, and then right in the middle, Revelation 21.8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, even if you feel good about a few of the items on this list, If you haven't practiced sorcery, congratulations. But all of us are idolaters, right? Because idolatry is not just bowing down to wooden or stone or even gold images that we have made. It is placing anyone in the place of God, which is what they were doing when they would bow down. You say, oh, I've never done that. But what is the thing that you have to have to be okay? What is the thing that if you could change it, then everything would be fine and you would have a good attitude about things? That's a hint at where your idols might be. If if people would just figure it out and do this thing that I need. I know none of you ever feel that way. I'm just kind of confessing my own uh, sins today. We are all idolaters. And even if you're not convinced by that one, you've told a lie, right? Only when you were small. All liars. And how many lies does it take to be a liar? One. How many sins does it take to be accountable, to be guilty for the whole law? One. God's law is a unity. If we have broken one commandment, we have broken them all. All it takes is breaking one law to be a law breaker. All it takes is one act of rebellion to be in rebellion. All it takes is one act of insurrection against the crown to be judged for it. Not one of us passed the test. Later in Revelation 21, again, speaking of that city, nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. We deserve to be on the outside. We deserve to be away from God's presence. Sin, Adam and Eve's sin and our sin, has separated us from God, the God who came to save us. Sin separates us from God, but Jesus has come to do something about it as our perfect priest. Jesus is the way to God. We sang just a few moments ago, O come to the Father through Jesus, His Son. We can never work our way back to God. There's no good that you or I can do that will make up for what we have already done wrong. But Jesus said to his disciples, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you hear even the language of presence in there? It's no one comes to the Father. It's not no one gets to avoid eternal punishment and have a nice eternity. It's no one comes to the Father the Father, except through me. It's almost like that's what we were made for. Another passage describing what Jesus came to do. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins. That's what He needed to suffer for. The righteous for the unrighteous. The one who had never done anything wrong for we who have done wrong. That He might bring us to heaven that He might bring us to God. This is what we were made for. Sin is not just a problem about how things are going to hurt and how we can have an eternity that doesn't hurt. We were made for so much more than that. You were made to know God and to be known by Him and to know Him perfectly, joyfully, to see Him face to face. All we like sheep, Isaiah 53, 6 says, have gone astray. 
We've turned every one of us to our own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. How do we get back to God? It's through Jesus. Just the verses right before that. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. See, what we deserve is eternal wrath, eternal punishment away from the presence of the Lord. And Jesus took every bit of that for everyone who will turn from their sins and trust in him. It was for our transgressions that he was wounded. He was bruised for our iniquities. It's by his stripes, by his wounds that we are healed. He took our place. He took what we deserve. And in his grace, he gives us what he has earned. Jesus has lived in eternal, beautiful, joyful, loving fellowship with His Father. And that's what He has purchased for us on the cross. It's so much bigger even than we can imagine what God has given to us through Jesus. So we can come to God through Jesus by faith turning from our sin and trusting in Him. And when we do, we have His promise that we are immediately, completely, and freely forgiven because Jesus has already paid the price. The book of Hebrews, where I had you turn to, and we'll read there now, is perhaps the greatest New Testament reflection on the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and the relationship between the two. And there's extended reflection on the priesthood, what happened through those sacrifices in the Old Testament and how they were never enough, but they pointed to a new covenant, to a better mediator, to a better priest who would offer himself as a sacrifice. So after meditating on that for several chapters, we have a conclusion, not the conclusion of the letter, but a conclusion here in Hebrews 10. Excuse me. Don't have to worry about that anymore. All right. First try. All right. One of the conclusions of Hebrews we find here in Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. So I'm going to read that now. Follow along in your Bible. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. See, we could never get back to God on our own. In ourselves, we should have zero confidence to enter the holy places. And the holy places there is talking about the holy of holies. The heavenly holy of holies where God's very presence dwells. We can't get there. But now he says, we have confidence. Why do we have confidence to enter those holy places? How can we pass through the curtain that's separating God from us? Remember from yesterday, that curtain was torn when Jesus died on the cross. And now that way is wide open for everyone who will come through Jesus. The author of Hebrews here describes the curtain now as his flesh. Peter tells us he took our sins in his body on the tree. We have someone who goes between us. We could never stand on our own before God. But with Jesus, we are accepted. Jesus offers himself as the perfect sacrifice, the one all those sacrifices of bulls and goats pointed to. He's the one who made the way for us so that through him, 
we can come. We come to God through Jesus by faith. Uh, let's see, some of you are so young that I'm just going to say a long time ago, I went to an Eagles game with a friend of mine. Uh, his name's Tim. I actually met him uh, when we sang in an opera together in college. And then we sang in a barbershop quartet together for the next four years. And then we got to serve here in Philadelphia for a long time and got to do a lot of singing together. They moved back down south now. But we went to an Eagles game, and the Eagles won. They scored about 56 points, so we went horse singing Fly, Eagles, Fly. For those of you who know what that is and appreciate that, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a great game. They were playing the Chicago Bears, and there was a group of four of us. There were three of us, and then the one guy brought his brother-in-law, who's from Chicago, who was wearing his Bears stuff. Uh, it was great. <laughs> We'll just leave that there. Before the game, my friend Tim says, hey, we can get in to an exclusive party that they're having at the Wells Fargo Center. So the Wells Fargo Center is where the Sixers and the Flyers play, right next to the link where the Eagles play. Okay, just for those of you who aren't uh, from Philly. <laughs> right, it's right next door, and there was a pregame VIP, like we definitely don't belong, kind of party that was going on. But his cousin was like in charge of it. He's like, hey, my cousin Paul said we can come. So we leave like three hours early for this game because we're going to the before party because there's free food. It's great. And so we're driving down, listening to music because he always plays me music if we're in a car together. And talking, and it's like, all right, what do we do? And this place, you enter from the outside, and you have to go up a set of stairs. And it's a pretty big set of stairs. And there's these couple of big, I don't know why I'm doing this right now. There's a couple of guys that are built very differently than me <laughs> who are at the bottom of the stairs. And we cannot just walk up the stairs. Who are you? Tim and Rob doesn't go very far, very many places. Like, well, do you know anybody here? You know, how do you, you don't have any of the normal things that would gain you access. And he says, well, and drops the name of his cousin. That still doesn't do anything yet, right? So those guys, they get on their radio, da 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 And then his cousin Paul comes down the stairs. And as soon as he is with us, it's like we're him. Now all of a sudden, oh, we are so delighted to have you here. Why, why don't you just go right up this way? Like the same guys that were like, who are you? What do you think you're doing here? You don't belong. Welcome. And we walked up the stairs, and we still felt like we didn't belong. But we were in. Why were we in? Because of anything we had done? No, because Paul said, they're with me. They're in. They have a right to be here. And for everyone who turns from their sins and trusts in Jesus, Jesus, who's so much better than a cousin named Paul, who's the perfect priest, who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice, says to his father, she's with me. He's with me. They can come. And we are welcomed. But we're not just welcomed in a way that like, well, we still don't really belong. We're welcomed like the father welcomed the prodigal son home. It's not, well, keep a distance. Don't eat too much. You'll give it away. We're his. He loves us. He's the one who put together the plan to get us there. He's the one who sent His own Son in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us back into right relationship with Himself. Not only positionally so we get in, but vitally so that we experience His presence both now and forever. He sent His Son to bring the sheep back home to the shepherd. 
And so a question, are you trusting in Jesus like that? Maybe for you, Christianity has meant a lot of measuring up, a lot of doing good and trying not to do bad. And maybe you've heard about Jesus dying for sins and you know that and you could answer all the Sunday school questions. But are you trusting in Jesus and his work alone for your access to God? Do you see the beauty of who he is and what he has done and all his perfections, all his glory, all his sinlessness becoming sin for you? so that you can live with God and with all his people forever in those new heavens and new earth. If not, today can be your day. Your counselors, any staff member, faculty member would love to talk with you. And when you turn from your sins and trust in him, you can be assured because of his promise that you are immediately, fully, freely, Forgiven. There's no waiting period. There's no cleaning yourself up. If you waited till then, you would never come. He saves us. It's His righteousness, His clothes that we get to wear, His credentials that we share. And for those who are trusting in Christ, you have been brought near, not just to a better life, but to God through Him. That is reason today to praise Him to rejoice in Him, to worship Him, and to fellowship with Him, to read His Word, to talk with Him in prayer. And when you stumble and fall, and that relationship is strained, you can come back to Him, and He will forgive you, just like He did in the beginning. In 1 John, in a book for believers, He says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. He always does the right thing, and it's just. It is the right thing for Him to forgive us because He loves us and because the price has been paid. So for those of you who are trusting in Christ, when you stumble and fall today, when you're unkind, when you're impatient, when you're frustrated, and you're sitting, you can come back to the Lord in confession and He immediately forgives you. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to be right with Him again. You can experience His gracious presence today, tomorrow, until the day of eternity. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask that You would do what only You can do. And if there is one here who is not yet fully trusting in the work the person, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Would you help that one to be convicted of their sin, to realize they can never make it back to you on their own, and to turn from that sin and trust in Christ alone, and to feel your love and your welcome. For all of us, would you help us to walk with you today in all our rehearsing and all our singing and all our playing and all our eating and in frisbee this afternoon and sing time tonight in every moment in every interaction would we be aware of your presence and your pleasure over us because of your son it's in jesus name that we pray amen